The opening bars of the aria L'Alma Mia Fra le Tempeste from Act One of Handel's Agrippina. The singer was the Trinidadian soprano Janine de Beek, and she was joined by Concerto Köln and Luca Quintavale on a new Berlin Classics album called Mirrors. And Janine is our guest this week. I'm James Jolly and welcome to this gramophone podcast, which is given in association with Leipzig, the city of music, and its two renowned flagships, the Opera Leipzig and the Gewandhaus zu Leipzig. Besides the great J.S. Bach, Leipzig has played host to many musicians, including Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi, who, as well as being music director of the great Gewandhaus Orchester, founded the city's first conservatory in 1843. Robert and Clara Schumann, Richard Wagner and Gustav Mahler all worked in the city. In May 2023, the Gewandhaus Orchestra will host a spectacular Mahler festival in Leipzig. To hear all of Mahler's symphonies performed by ten world-class orchestras will be a truly unique experience for all classical music lovers. Stay with us for more information. Mirrors is Janine de Beek's first solo album, and I caught up with her in Paris, where she was about to start rehearsing for a run of Alcina at the Opéra de Paris. So, so you've just finished performances uh, in the coronation of Popea, winding up, I believe, in Vicenza in the Teatro Olimpico. Yeah. How was that? The most incredible experience I've ever had in my career so far. That space, I mean, I stood really completely speechless and in awe of where we were. And you're not allowed to walk on the set that's there from 1585. It was a set that was created for Oedipus Rex. It's almost like you have to teleport or transport yourself back in time to know what people were wearing at the time to come to this theater. I'd start to imagine what the actors were going through, the makeup, the if there was any lights, but the acoustic in there, you don't have to stress or do anything. You can, a big voice can be in there, a small voice can be in there, a pin could drop and you would hear it. Every single nuance is is heard and audible. And that's why text is very important in there. And the, the audience gets a, a, a direct... Uh, line of communication between artists and, and themselves. So for both parties, for the audience and for the performer, it is a direct communication line. There's no distance between the two. So you are all, you are both involved in the creation of the art that's being made on stage. I was really happy to be there. I was really happy that the tour culminated and ended there because it was a highlight, a big highlight for uh, for all of us there. I have to say, it's, it's rather cold in there at this time. Very cold. The, the audience members got blankets when we were performing. <laughs> it's freezing. Uh, but they cannot change the temperature because um, of the set, you know? They have to preserve it. So we're here to talk about your, well, two records, actually, because your solo album, Mirrors, is just out, as is the recording of Ramos Platé with uh, Les Arts Florissants and William Christie. So it's a kind of double Baroque fest. I know you sing an enormously wide repertoire, but do I get the feeling that Baroque music is particularly close to your heart? At the moment, yes. Baroque music is very close to my heart due to the message that it sends and also because of I, I find those characters rather easy to emulate, to also to, to play. Because I think that the composers at that time, I mean, not negating the composers that come after, but I've, I find that the composers of that time really took these characters, especially for Mia, the, the, these heroines, and gave them a complete journey from beginning to end. And you see how complex the characters are. And you get all of their emotions from beginning to end. There's nothing missed, and I love that. Well, as human beings, we go through so many different emotions and we are complex creatures. 
we as artists as, as opera singers we get to experience these um the, all of these emotions in, in in one opera for example i think that's that think that's rather fun and i love exposing myself like this i love bearing my my emotions and my soul on the stage to my audience so nothing's better than having an opera that you can see the journey of this character through yourself The concept of mirrors is that you've got three heroines set by Handel, Rodolinda, Alcina and Cleopatra, but also set by other composers who, you know, whose names won't be so immediately obvious to us. So the mirror, I guess, is that these characters are reflected multiple ways. What we did was we took Handel heroines and Handel operas and we took if not the same character, but the same opera of his contemporaries and mirrored them against each other. And so you sort of see the one character in itself um, in the versions of one composer to the other. And you see the multifacetedness of this character on both sides. And it's almost like looking through a, a broken glass. It's, 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 it's really, really interesting. And the one that I find the most interesting is actually the Broski with, uh, it's, I mean, it's my favorite. Everyone knows it's my favorite aria on the album. But what's interesting is that Handel composed the aria Mi Restano Le Lagrime from his opera, Alcina, and Broski composed Mi Restano Le Lagrime from Disola d'Alcina, but it's not written for Alcina. It's written for the other female character, Morgana, and it, it has a different uh, feeling and a different tempo. Actually, it's much quicker <laughs> than what we actually did in the recording, uh, written, the, the tempo marking, but we see and feel and especially with the score of the music of Broski, we feel a, a sort of, even though it's a crying aria, we feel a little bit of lightness or a lift in that aria, as opposed to Handel's version of Mires Noi Lagrime, which is extraordinarily heartbreaking. And I think that's fascinating to see that, they, that these two composers around the same time took this text and libretto and made their own version and their own take on the, on, on the piece. You're obviously a, a, a real stage animal. I mean, you love acting. Is it difficult all of a sudden having just in one aria to encapsulate the whole of a character and then, as it were, stand and deliver that? No, because we're trained quite well to find the subtext for each aria. So, yes, it can be quite difficult but as you train yourself to tap into the, the story of your own personal subtext to get you there, right there into the emotional moment. It's not, it's not too difficult, no. And presumably now you've done the album, are you actually gonna sort of, as it were, tour it? Are, you gonna, are we gonna have concerts of Mirrors? At the moment we have a few concerts in February around the Netherlands area. We're moving to France and possibly to Germany. At the moment, of course, because of Corona, a lot of promoters are delay are pushing back the the concerts that they had that were cancelled and moving. So it's some time has been pushed back. Um, also, because of my work, I'm still involved in a, a few opera contracts that I'm uh, working with different opera companies. So we are gonna gonna be touring it a lot more, just a bit later. And you've got fantastic collaborators. I mean, you don't get much better than Concerto Köln. I mean, how did that happen? Well, I honestly heard that they were interested in me, which was pretty phenomenal because they are one of the oldest Baroque uh, orchestras in the world. And to catch on their radar... Uh, I was speechless. I, I didn't know what to do. I said, oh my gosh, what am I going to sing with them? I, 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 a ton of repertoire that I, I, I was already looking at. 
yeah, we just um, had a conversation and wanted to know how best we could work together, what how best we could both shine on this album. And I think we turned out with a, a, a pretty good product, a very good product. <laughs> Because, I mean, the orchestra, you know, it's so steeped in, in music of that period. It must bring its own kind of personality. Yes, they do. <laughs> they most definitely do. And I learned a lot from them because they, they're, they're, of course, they're, they're thoroughly experienced. And even during the recording, I mean, there were some things that I, I didn't really know how to do. I asked for their opinions and they were very kind and they showed me a lot. Luca Quintavale, who's um, the musical director, is a, an Italian Baroque specialist. So I really, I couldn't have gotten through or done this uh, recording uh, without his uh, support and his knowledge. Uh, he taught everyone quite a lot and, and we're, very, we're all very in, in, uh, grateful to him. With the orchestra and the way that they play and the the silvery tones that come out of their out of their instruments, I mean, Evgeny who played the first violin on 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 that little last number, Mi Restano Le Lagrime. I mean, he's really so brilliant, so intuitive, and we really sang together. It was it was really really so easy to 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 play and sing with them. And that's the other thing I forgot to say about mu about Baroque music that I love so much. It's the collaboration, and it's also the the jazz like uh, nuance that we that they have. And in, in, it's almost like jazz learned from them. <laughs> this improvisation style when they get to the return, and I love the fact that you can put your own stamp on the music. And it's never repeated. It, it can't be repeated by somebody else, or it shouldn't be. Or if you do repeat it, you have to say that it's it's that person's ornamentation, you know? So it's really nice, to, this exciting thing to like reinvent yourself, reinvent the music all the time on something. Else. And it's the only genre that we're able to do that, other than jazz. Quite a few of these, the arias on the record are coloratura. I mean, they're quite, you know, they're quite complex, you know, lots of fireworks. Do you find it easy to, as it were, when you're performing coloratura music, to make the coloratura a logic as to why you're singing that kind of style of music, rather than just sort of firing fireworks left, right and centre, drawing it from the, the emotion of the aria? You know, why am I singing and why am I sending all these things up into the sky? Why am I doing that? Is that, that must be fun, especially working with a, a, a group like Concerto Köln. If I understand your question correctly, you're you're asking me if the coloratura is coming from an emotional place or whether it's just, you know, technical. Yeah. For me, it's both. Of course, you have to have a solid technique in order to execute coloratura. And coloratura needs to be quite precise. The emotion, yes, helps. And, it, and obviously, you sing coloratura differently based on what the aria is about. I believe. But amongst that, technique really is, for me, the driving force when I sing coloratura first and the emotion comes after. Because if the emotion is the driving factor, then you can get quite carried away uh, with it. So one has to leave, for me, the emotion for the more lyrical lines. And when I get to the coloratura, I'm in a mode of a specific technique, a specific, my mind center is, is, is there. And then I can come back to the lyrical line of emotion. Because, you know, when we are singing coloratura and you are having a duet, for example, in L'Alma Mia, I'm doing a duet with the clarinet. We have to be so in sync together, listening to each other for this moment. Um, and she can be coming from a different place in emotion, and I'm coming from a different place of emotion. And so therefore, we have to find together the balance to meet. And so right there at the center is how does the technique drive this particular line of music together so that we can be one voice so all that to say, yes, the emotion is there. But for me, the technique is the driving force. 
Now, the other recording that features you that's just come out is Rameau Platé, the Les Alflorissons with William Christie. I mean, how different is the language and the whole sort of style of French Baroque music as opposed to German-Italian on your mirrors? I mean, do you have to, things like embellishments and all that sort of stuff, is that a whole, as it were, new language you have to sort of get your head around? French Baroque is a, is a completely different animal. I am really still learning about that genre. I hope I get to do more of it. Um, I learned pretty fast uh, about it for, for this uh, particular show. I really wished and hoped that we had gotten to do live performances or even just more performances of, of it because for me it still needed to be embedded in my soul properly to, to really execute it the way that I wanted to. I felt still a bit like a beginner, uh, actually, on, on, on French Baroque. French is a language that I love and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at, but the Baroque style is, is, is something that I'm still learning and very eager to, to have another opportunity, another stab at it, actually. But because we are taught the Italian style of singing first when you're at school, this comes naturally when you move into Italian Baroque or um, just in general Italian music. So there is a big difference between the two. And how did you find the experience of recording? I mean, particularly with the mirrors, because, you know, just you, you are the, you know, the star of the album. You know, here you are in a room with the musicians, no audience. I mean, was was that something you, you enjoyed? <laughs> Let's see. If I'm being honest, I was very nervous when I walked into the studio. <laughs> I mean, I, I had rehearsals with Concerto Kern several times before, I mean, rehearsal is rehearsal. When you realize that you're walking into the studio and this is it, we, we, we're recording now. I was very nervous. I wanted to get everything right. You know, the first take, you know, um, I was very frustrated when I wasn't getting it right in the first sort of, you know, takes. But I don't know, the engineer, Luca, the orchestra, you know, they are doing this uh, so often. So they were so reassuring and telling me don't worry we have time we can re-record it we can redo it and 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 get the right take that you want i'm i'm quite new i'm very new in in the recording process and they made it really comfortable for me to to just relax and be myself you really have to get out of the idea of recording but more into performance mode and you know forget about all of that but really get into the to what you know you set aside your emotions you set aside your technique and you put them in the spots that you need them to be and tap into them when you need to and then you get the product that you want but if you only focus on just one thing on getting it right 100 percent, it can really block you so I had a few hours of that block <laughs> when I first started, but then I, I got really calm and really released for the next, uh, we recorded for four days, actually, this album, quite short, but really intense, really concentrated, and, uh, and yeah. So what are, the, what are the coming weeks and months got in store for you? Uh, at the moment, I'm doing Alcina. I'm doing the title role here at Paris Opera. It's a debut at the house as well as debut in the role. Um, it's a Robert Carson production. Beautiful, beautiful production. It was premiered in 1998-99 with Rene Fleming and Natalie Desay and Susan Graham. And Renee actually wrote me an, an email to wish me luck, so that was very sweet and kind of her. And after that, I move into actually uh, recital mode and uh, touring mirrors next year. I'm giving my debut Carnegie Hall recital in uh, in April. So those are two big highlights for me at the moment for the season. And then uh, I end the season 
performing with the Vienna Philharmonic, as well as um, I'm singing Anaïs in Moïse et Fégron at uh, Aix-en-Provence this summer. Well, that's a nicely, nicely varied, yeah. varied season <laughs> for you. It is, it is. And I, and yeah. I'm happy and I'm also happy that it you know um actually I'm moving into bel canto repertoire as well which is nice and you know getting my feet dipped in the water with that so that's that's going to be interesting and it's going to be fun well the best of luck thank you i really appreciate it Is uh, Infelice from Handel's De Damia, and it comes from Janine de Beek's album Mirrors, which is just out from Berlin Classics, as is the Harmonia Mundi recording of Rameau's Plate with Les Arts Florissant and William Christie, on which Janine sings La Folie. This gramophone podcast is given in association with Leipzig, the city of music. From May the 11th to the 29th, 2023, the Gewandhaus Orchestra will host a Mahler Festival in Leipzig, the city that was home to the composer for two decisive years of his life, and where he became the musician we know today, a composer of enthralling symphonies. The symphonic canon of Gustav Mahler forms the foundation of the Mahler Festival 2023. Leipzig and the Gewandhaus Orchestra offer a particularly authentic setting for the festival and a unique opportunity to hear the complete symphonies and other orchestral works interpreted by 10 world-class orchestras in Leipzig, the city of music. Full information at mahlerfestival.de. Gramophone podcasts are free, but if you enjoy them, then a really great way to support our work is to take out a subscription to Gramophone magazine, which is packed full of expert reviews and in-depth articles about the latest classical music releases every month. And if you head over to gramophone.co.uk slash subscribe and enter the code podcast20 in the checkout, you can even get a 20% discount off any subscription package. We really value your support. And do look out for another Gramophone podcast very soon.